today's lecture is going to deal with stress. We're going to define stress and then we're going to talk about some of the management strategies for stress. So starting out, stress is a physiological and emotional response to some sort of stimulus. So we have a functional change, the physiology, and a psychological change, the emotion that occurs as we respond to a stimuli. And the stimuli can be a variety of, of different, uh, different things. Stimuli can be anything that disrupts the livable balance or what we would call homeostasis. So as you may have been able to guess, these stimuli aren't always necessarily going to lead towards uh, adverse situations. When the stimuli become stressors, they simply are stimuli that lead to a stress response. So the stimuli becomes a stressor, and that stressor is an event that produces stress and a stress response both physiologically and emotionally. And there are a variety of different stressors that the average college student may experience. It is a major life change. Major life changes can often lead to a stress response. You also may experience stress from your daily responsibilities. Things like your job or your family or money. There could be stresses in the environment around you. Excessive heat or cold or excessive humidity. And then for the college age student, there's also some very college age specific stressors. Those stressors may include some of your interpersonal relationships, dating relationships, or uh, friendship relationships. It can lead towards stress. Your academics, your academic pursuit could be a stressful thing. Another big one for college students is time management. Managing your time wisely so that you can optimize time to accomplish all the things you need to accomplish. School costs money, so it could also have a financial component. So all of these things can be stressors. When you interact with a stressor, that leads towards a stress response. And again, that stress response is associated with the physiological changes that occur because of the stress that are associated with the stress. And our bodies are set up, they've been created to be able to deal with stress to a certain uh, limit. And we have a physiological stress system that helps to manage that physiological response. And the physiological stress system is comprised of two physiological systems. The first is the nervous system. There's going to be a functional component to the nervous system. The other is the endocrine. We'll get to the endocrine here in just a second. Uh, the autonomic nervous system is going to be part of this physiological stress system. And the term autonomic just simply means that it's under automatic function. Frequently, the autonomic nervous system is just simply abbreviated as ANS. And again, the autonomic nervous system is the portion of your nervous system that has automatic control. 
control over a variety of variables, such as a variety of physiological functions. And this automatic functioning is unconscious. You're not making decisions. So how the organism responds is under this unconscious decision-making process. It's not something that you're actively participating in. And there are two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, and they oppose each other, or their functions are opposite. I'm going to be sympathetic nervous system, which prepares the body to be calm, or it calms the body as a calming effect. The opposite of the parasympathetic nervous system is going to be the sympathetic nervous system. And this portion of the autonomic nervous system is what prepares the body to respond to stress. And so we're going to see the interplay of these two systems as we begin to discuss the stress response in a little more detail here in just a moment. But before we do that, I also want to briefly introduce you to the endocrine system, which is a complementary part of the stress system. And there are endocrine functions that are very important. Uh, before I do that, though, let me go back and show you here the autonomic nervous system with our parasympathetic division and our sympathetic division. Remember, this is preparing us to be calm. This is preparing us for a stress response. And you can see that there are nerve fibers that lead away from the brain and the spinal cord. And on the sympathetic side, so over on this side, we're going to have dilation of the pupils. We're going to have the adrenal uh, cortex is going, to, uh, is going to change. We're going to have a change in our heart rate, a change in the salivary gland, a change in our lungs that are all going to support the organism to undergo this stress response. We're preparing all of these tissues and organs to be able to deal with the stress. And so we're going to need to have increased breathing in our lungs. We're going to have to have increased blood flow coming from our heart. We're going to inhibit saliva because we're not really going to be focusing on digestion here, breaking down foods, but actually um, going to be preparing those uh, util those food stuffs, those food utilization sources to, to supply energy to all these other tissues that are working. On the other side, the parasympathetic division, everything is basically the opposite. We reduce uh, dilation of the pimples. We constrict the, the pupils. Uh, the heart rate is going to settle down, contraction strength is going to settle down, breathing rate is going to reduce, we're going to begin to increase blood flow to our digestive organs, bringing uh, uh, absorptive activity uh, back to the, to the organism. So a variety of different things that are going to happen from our autonomic nervous system. Now the endocrine system, the function here is going to help to complement the action here of the autonomic nervous system. The endocrine system is actually going to be a series of glands, tissues, and cells that excrete chemicals called hormones. And these hormones are secreted into the bloodstream. And once in the bloodstream, they circulate throughout the whole organism. And these hormones interact with other tissues called target tissues to alter the function and the physiology of those cells and tissues. Incorporated within the endocrine system, we have a number of stress hormones, chemicals that are excreted in response to stress that send messages to other tissues. And they're going to help those other tissues to activate. One of the tissues that is activated by these stress hormones is our sympathetic nervous system. So we're going to activate our sympathetic nervous system by increasing the presence of so-called stress hormones. 
muscle. These hormones also interact with other tissues and help those tissues undergo changes in their processes. So body processes are changed frequently. It's to accelerate those tissues. It can also lead towards things like an increase in tension and alertness. Your attention and your alertness. These stress hormones, or so-called stress hormones, are going to include some you've probably heard of before. One of them is epinephrine, and you may know it by its alternative name, which is adrenaline. This acts on the heart and helps to accelerate heart rate. So we increase blood flow and we increase nutrients to some of the tissues that are going to help mitigate and help us get through this stressful process. Uh, analog hormone to epinephrine is a hormone called norepinephrine, also can be referred to as noradrenaline. This particular stress hormone upregulates the sympathetic nerves or sympathetic neurons. So it helps to prime the neurons of the sympathetic nervous system to function and to do their job that we were just discussing with the previous figure. Another stress hormone is a hormone called cortisol. Spell that right. Let me spell cortisol correctly. Cortisol is going to have effects on glucose utilization. It helps to adjust that energy supply. And then the last hormone that's produced is a hormone called the endorphins. And this is a class of hormone that's associated with the inhibition of pain. So endorphin levels will increase in anticipation that this stressful event may actually induce some sort of pain. So with that, now that we have a basic understanding of the nervous system, in particular the autonomic nervous system and the stress uh, hormones found within the endocrine system, we can begin to talk about the stress response. And the stress response is actually a general term that's used to describe a similar response for most all stressors. Now one thing about this, because it is similar for all different stressors, this often means that we undergo sort of an inappropriate response for the situation. So when I say it, uh, often an inappropriate situation, because it is a similar response for all different stressors, you get a very similar response to fight off a bear in a very similar response to take an exam. Two vastly different situations, vast amounts uh, of differences in the stress of those two situations, yet the stress response is similar for those two. And what that means is we as the individual must manage the response. So when we look at the stress response, we have to manage it. And even though the response is very similar, what we do control is our behavioral response. And it's this behavioral response that is actually going to govern 
the magnitude of the stress response. So in other words, the stress response is initiated when we have to fight off a bear, and it's initiated when we have to take an exam, but the magnitude is modified between those two situations. Obviously, fighting off a bear is going to be a far more violent, deadly um, situation compared to taking an exam, and we need a much higher stress response in order to survive a bear attack versus taking an exam. Now, this behavior is going to be regulated by the somatic nervous system. Now, what I've already mentioned is the stress response is primarily under autonomic control. But this behavioral response to that stress response is regulated by this thing called the somatic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system is actually under conscious control. So the somatic nervous system is going to help us regulate our response to the stress response. And it does it in two ways. It helps us to alter our motor function accordingly and helps us to modify or alter our sensory function accordingly. Now the behavioral response, how we utilize our somatic nervous system is going to be affected by three factors. It's affected by three factors. And those three factors, in no particular order, are going to be personality, gender, This idea of gender, male versus female, one of the things that shows up here is our response to oxytocin, which is a, a, a pituitary that affects females, higher levels than females, and this appears to regulate the nurturing nature, peacemaking response in women. Oh, let me go ahead and get right this. It's right over here. It's just nurturing. So this last point here is oxytocin appears to regulate the nurturing nature that we see in women. So your gender is obviously going to be affected by oxytocin. You can be more nurturing if you're female, typically less nurturing if you're male. And this certainly affects that behavioral response along with our personality. The last factor that's going to affect the behavioral response to stress is past experience. And these past experiences can certainly cause a variety of different a variety of different responses to stress. So why do we even really care about stress? And the reason that we care about stress from a wellness perspective is because when stress is poorly managed, it is well known to lead to reductions in overall wellness. So poorly managed stress leads to reductions in wellness. And some of the things that we see with poorly managed stress are things like increased cardiovascular disease or the increasing prevalence of cardiovascular disease in individuals who 
poorly managed stress. We also have seen altered immune function. And lead towards autoimmune diseases. Poorly managed stress also can lead towards sociopathic behavior. So it's going to be optimal for individuals to manage their stress well. You're always going to experience stress no matter what stage of life you're in. And if you allow that stress to be poorly managed, it can lead towards alterations to health. And so one of the things that we're going to attempt to do today is increase our awareness on how we can manage our behavioral response to stress. So we're going to look at some behavioral management strategies. So some things that are poor quality strategies that you may be utilizing now and may not even really know that you're using these strategies. When you get into a stressful situation, you have that stress response, and your behavioral response occurs. Part of that behavioral response may be things like tobacco use or alcohol use or drug use. may involve yourself in sexual promiscuity. Or binge eating, the, the consumption of a large amount of calories in a short amount of time. So all of these are poor ways in which you can respond behaviorally to stress. So these are not good strategies. There are better strategies that can be employed or what we would call better quality strategies. One of the most optimal ways to deal with stress is to focus your attention on hope. Understanding that hope is in Christ alone. So just simply focusing on hope, looking for the hope through the stressful situation, finding that hope in Christ can be a very beneficial way to manage stress. In addition to finding hope, exercise is a great stress management tool. It decreases anxiety, results in an increase in your sense well being and it also alters the energy cycling pattern that arises in the stress response. So exercise very, very good tool for stress and for stress management. Sleep and getting adequate amounts of sleep is a good stress management tool. Practicing time management. And in this idea of time management, sitting down and setting your priorities. And you can set these priorities on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis, you can set them on a daily basis. What are the things that you want to accomplish? And use a schedule to time out how you're going to accomplish these priorities. Set goals. A big one for college students is to avoid procrastination. Another thing that is important in the area of time management is to learn 
to say no. There's all kinds of different opportunities for activities on a college campus, and you cannot be involved in all of them. You're going to have to learn to say no to many of them. We need to work on investing, or I'm sorry, identifying good ways to invest your time. What are going to be the things, the activities, that will optimize time management and thereby help you manage to reduce stress. Your nutritional habits, your diet habits can also be very important to manage stress. A balanced diet is important. Consuming an early meal, breakfast meal, after you've woken up is a good strategy for managing stress. Avoid stimuli such as caffeine. Now you don't have to remove caffeine completely from your diet, but it should not be one of your main food sources. Another strategy is to become a good and effective communicator. And lastly, this general strategy of the last general strategy for uh, behavioral management of stress is to find a good social support system. Find people that you can rely on and talk to when you're in a stressful situation. Now, just as I close out this lecture, I want to real quick identify some of the behavioral and stress management. Uh, strategy specific for college students for this part in your life, this time in your life. One of the most important things to do in an academic setting is to manage your class responsibilities. To manage your class responsibilities. You're going to be given a syllabus for each of your classes with the expectations for the semester. And you're typically given a syllabus very early on in the semester, typically on the very first day. And this is going to give you a schedule of all of the things that you're going to have to do. The chapters you're going to read out of your textbook, the lectures that you're going to have to attend, the tests that you're going to have to take, the assignments that will be due. You're going to have to manage those responsibilities. And there's a couple things that you can do that are going to help you to manage those responsibilities and to assist you in promoting good stress habits or good behavioral habits to manage those stresses of class responsibility. One of them is to practice long-term study. Practice long-term study. So what exactly does that mean? For all of your classes, you will need to read your textbooks. And you will need to read those textbooks on a daily basis. And you should typically think of time required to read those textbooks on a daily basis is to set aside one to three hours per class. So if you have four classes, you could be setting aside up to 12 hours per day. Now, you're probably not going to have to set aside that much time on a daily basis because there's going to be some classes that are going to be less textbook intensive and you're going to have some that are going to be more textbook intensive. So you might actually be looking more along the lines of four to five to six hours of reading to stay abreast of all of the material that you're being taught in your classes. In addition to reading the textbook, you want to study on a daily basis. You want to engage the material daily, and you want to do it in such a way that you study sequentially. And what I mean by studying sequentially is you don't want to study material after you've learned it on that day, and then the next day go and study the new material. You actually want to continually go back to the older material 
restudy that, then study the new material, and continue to do this for a prolonged period of time. What you'll begin to notice is within a couple of weeks, you're actually going to be able to understand the older material far better because you've been exposed to it for 21 days, for three weeks. For most of your classes, it's going to be adequate to apply one to three hours per class per day. So again, you're looking to a maximum of 12 hours, which is a little bit of a problem if you're reading 12 hours and you're studying 12 hours, there's the whole day. So fortunately, many of your classes are going to be on this lower end, and you might look at reading your textbook on a daily basis and studying on a daily basis for each of your classes, and it may consume four hours a piece. And so there's an eight hour total, and then you're going to be in class two to three hours every day. And as a general rule, you're really looking at a 10 hour work day, which gives you an additional 14 hours for sleeping, for eating, and for some free time. But if you apply this sequential approach, rather than just trying to cram everything into uh, a few hours before the test or a few days before the test, you're going to see greater benefits as you go through and prepare for those exams. So we want to prepare for exams and quizzes over weeks, not over days. The final strategy specific to college students that will help in this stress regulation behavior is to avoid overcommitment. And really, you have to avoid, avoid overcommitment mostly to social activities. And that includes your religious related activities as well. So you have to manage your time. Now, always make sure that you go back to that uh, original point that you can manage. Uh, the stress response by focusing on hope. Certainly, you've got to stay focused on your, uh, your daily devotion to the Lord. But there's certainly religious activities that go above and beyond your daily devotion. Uh, it might be hanging out with a church group or hanging out with your Bible study and not really doing anything that's um, uh, engaging uh, more than just a social activity. So you have to avoid overcommitting to both religious and non-religious social activities so that you can optimize the time that you focus on preparing for class and managing the classroom experience. So hopefully these uh, strategies will help you as you pursue your academic degree.